Good evening, everybody. This is Night Flight. I'm Judith Kroba, and tonight I have Jerry Mazinski with me. He has been working as a mental health pr practitioner and a counselor for 35 years. And I'm very happy to have him here and his insights. So, Jerry Mazinski, welcome to Night Flight. Okay, thank you for having me. Jerry, would you like to add anything to what I just said about you, what the listener should know? Uh, well, it, basically, I've been at this for 35 years. I worked for seven years in the biggest state mental hospital in the United States. Uh, at the time I was there, the population was probably around 4,000, but it had hit 10,000 just uh, maybe five years before I, I left that place. Um, from there, I went uh, to a PhD program, and when I got out of there, I went to Arizona, worked in a ER doing psych crisis, and from there, two years in a mental health center. From there, about uh, 18 years working in the psychology department of a state prison, and that's where I learned a lot. Um, it, at the state hospital, uh, the unwritten rule was you don't upset psychotic patients. And, and they got upset when you began asking them about their voices. They didn't want to talk about them. And, you know, you can't blame them. Look what happens when, you know, somebody starts talking about hearing voices that nobody else can. The other people are spooked. Uh, parents get upset. They say they're possessed. Everybody gets all upset. Friends start backing away, thinking this is a weirdo. They take them to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist says, listen, your brain is broken. You're crazy. Uh, you've got to take these toxic meds for the rest of your life. And if they don't do it, they lock them up. Uh, they try to tell the psychiatrist, but, you know, these voices are real. They're, they're, they're real. And they go, you're crazy. They, you know, we don't hear them. Nobody else hears them. You hear them. You're, you're nuts. Um, so they learn very quickly not to tell people about the voices. And in fact, instead of psychiatry listening to them, I mean, after all, this is diagnosed as a thought disorder. <laughs> and these are thoughts that these guys are having. And they won't, they won't listen. They, they just blow them off and say, you're hallucinating. We're going to tell you what's happening to you. You know, you've got a chemical imbalance in your brain. And you're psychotic and you're crazy and you're insane. And you've got to take these toxic meds for the rest of your life. Not good news. So it's like they're just blown away. So um, from there, if they don't take their meds, they lock them up. They put them in a insane asylum. And so they learn not to talk about these things. In order to not to have to take those medicine, or why? Or they just do not want to be labeled crazy. Well, both. Now, the medications have some nasty side effects, you know, several nasty side effects. But over the past 2,000 years, considering the other treatments that they've tried, you know, going back, uh, going back 2,000 years ago to ancient Egypt, they had a very detailed description of paranoid schizophrenia on, what was it, the Eber uh, papyrus? And what they would do back then would be to drill a hole in the person's head, thinking that whatever's in there would get out. Um, in most cases, that didn't work. If they had some pressure on the brain, I mean, that would work. But it didn't do anything for the voices. So, you know, the human race has been plagued with this malady for well over 2,000 years. You know, um, and then if you, you go back down through it, um, or some other things they tried. Uh, they, back in the 1800s, they would also drill a hole in the patient's head and they would pour alcohol in there. 
thinking that they were going to get rid of the voices that way. And it didn't work. So they, they went from that to um, filling them with sulfur to increase their body temperature, the to, to, to artificial fever, thinking that whatever the virus or whatever it was in there, that increased fever would drive these things away. No, it, it, it didn't work. So then they went to hot and cold baths. They'd throw them in there and, and, and freeze them and roast them and thinking that that would do something. It, it didn't work. Uh, then they moved to insulin shock. So they just give them massive doses of insulin, put them into a coma, and then thinking that that might help. They were kind of worn out. They didn't have any energy to cause problems after that. And, and back in the old days, in the 1800s and early 1900s, before the inception of antipsychotic medications, um, they were looking for any way to control these guys. Because uh, you have these voices telling them to attack the staff, uh, to do all these crazy things. Uh, I, I mean, it was bedlam, <laughs> basically bedlam. And the only way they could control them before that time was by these insulin shocks, uh, electroshock therapy, and wrapping them up in a straitjacket until they just, you know, exhausted themselves. So from the insulin shock, they went to something called electroshock therapy, and they were still doing that at the time I worked at the state hospital. And what they do is put these paddles, and they were about this big, on each side of the patient's head, and I watched one of these, and I've got a pretty strong stomach, but after, after seeing that, I, I almost fainted. Um, do you want to hear about what one of those things was like? Yeah, sure. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. This is what I experienced. I got a call from a, uh, another psych on, in one of the other units who said, listen, they're, they're going to carry on a shock treatment here for the students. Uh, they're inviting us if we want to come. So I said, yeah, I've never seen one of these. I've heard about them. Uh, I'll be there in a minute. So I rushed over to this different psych unit where my friend was, and uh, we walked into this big room with square pillars and tile floor. Otherwise, there was nothing much there. And here in the middle of the floor was a group of students surrounding this gurney with nobody was on it at the time. And here's the psychiatrist telling them about this shock machine. And what it was was a little wooden box about this big, and it had knobs and dials on it and a meter, and then the electrodes were about this size. And they'd, they'd put jelly on them, and they'd clamp them to the side of the patient's head, shave their hair, and then wrap them on with something. And uh, the psychiatrist said, well, listen, if we didn't put that jelly on there, we would actually burn the skin on the patient. So I'm thinking, holy cow. <laughs> so here he is answering all these questions, and... Uh, then he finally turns to a couple of nurses and said, okay, bring the patient in. So a few minutes later, on either side of this little skinny, you know, fragile old lady who was looked like she had just gotten out of a concentration camp where these nurses that was kind of dragging her over to the gurney where this machine was. And she seemed to know what was going to go on, so she kind of backed up to it, and she got on it by herself, unbelievably. And then this guy, the psychiatrist, uh, got this horse needle. I mean, it was like about this big around and about this long. And he f stuck it into this vial of a clear fluid. And it wasn't clear. It was milky fluid. And he drew it in there. And I'm looking at this thing, and it was humongous. It was giant. And I asked him, I said, what is that? And he said, it's tranquilizer. It's muscle relaxer. And I said, why, why are you giving, I mean, I said, it looks like a horse needle. Why are you giving that to her? And he said, if we didn't, when we gave her the shock, she would snap her bones while she was having the convulsions. 
and I'm like a treatment that shocks, snaps bones. And, you know, so they strapped her down on her hands and her arms and her legs and her feet. And here she is strapped tight to this gurney and he gets this giant needle and he sticks it in her arm and she's kind of looking like, you know, you know, like, help me. I don't want to do this again. You know, I mean, you look at her eyes and it's like, you know, I felt sorry for her. And he stuck that thing in. Instead of just pushing that fluid in, he drew it back and filled it full of blood and then swished it back and forth a few times to mix the blood with this stuff. And then he pushed it in. And I'm sitting there like, whoa. Yeah. And uh, then he starts, he brings up the electrodes and he said, these are the electrodes and, and we're going to shoot electricity through her brain. It's going to go in one side. It's going to go out the other. And we have to put this jelly on so it makes the contact. Otherwise, it'll burn her skin. And so the nurses wrap that around. And then the students are asking a few questions. And I'm standing there, like, looking at this, like, whoa. And then he goes, okay, everybody stand back. You know, I'm about ready to administer the shock. And so I stand back, and I'm looking. And he flips his switch. He just starts jerking all over the place. I mean, it's like she was going to break out of those bounds and get this little old lady is just convulsed all over, the, you know, and it's like this seemed to go on forever and I'm standing there. How long is he going to do this? Finally, he shuts the thing down and she's just, she wet her pants. I mean, and I'm st staring at this and then the students start asking questions and I'm like looking at her and he's, up there, you know, da 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 da. It was like he was like a showman putting on a show for these students, and you could tell he was enjoying the attention. And I'm staring at her, and she's turning cyanotic. She's turning purple. And I look up at him, and he's still da 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 da. And then I'm like, wait a minute, hey, look at her. She's turning cyanotic. She's dying. And he, like as an afterthought, he goes, oh oh. And he goes and he gets the those shocker things for the heart those paddles and he starts that machine he had it ready so apparently he expected something like this and he shocks her again and she jumps again you know held constrained by the the straps that they had her and then her heart starts back again and she starts turning normal and i'm looking at this going holy cow man <laughs> And I'm in shock. I mean, I'm just in shock. And I look at my friend and I said, uh, yeah, let's get out of here. And as I'm walking out, I started passing out. I grabbed this post and I just was holding on to this post. I mean, it was so traumatic to have seen that, that it took me a minute or two to kind of get my wits about me before I could leave. And they were administering 3,000 of these things a year. 3,000, and most of the time, they didn't do it for any treatment value. A lot of times, it was the attendants who would tell the psychiatrist, this guy is acting up, we're having trouble controlling him, we think he needs an ECT, and the psychiatrist would go, oh, okay, that's fine, roll him in there. Now, with regard to schizophrenia, I did find it interesting that those shocks did stop the voices for a short period of time, you know, maybe up to a week, the voices disappeared. So there was a correlation between that shock and the voices actually shutting up, but they would always return. The other thing, it did help with depression for a short while, but the side effects were it killed massive amounts of brain cells. And there was one neurologist who reported that he could see a difference in the composition of the brain after even one of these things. And they gave them repeatedly. And like I said, often it was for punishment because once you get hit by that, you're kind of wiped out. You know, you just, you don't have any energy to, to cause any problems for a good while after that because your brain is stunned and you're just kind of like, oh, geez, you know. Um, like I said, they, that was common treatment there. So now I forgot your question. What was it? Was like a, what? Did, what did I notice? Well, my um, I wanted to ask you 
you went at one point into a completely different direction. So what sparked your suspicion that there might be something else going on than what the official... Oh, I, I can tell you that. Um, the, the first suspicion I had, <clears throat> and when I, when I first started work at the state hospital, I believed like everybody else. I was taught and everybody else believed that this was a chemical imbalance of the patient's brain and that these medications and what they were were major tranquilizers somehow temporarily straightened out whatever that imbalance was. But as I watched a number of different psychiatrists, they never gave even one course of lab work to try to check and see what that chemical imbalance in the brain was and how far off it was. You know, like, you know, regular doctors, they'll give you blood work and you have all these scales and they say, oh, well, it falls in between this scale, you know, so it's high, it's low, it's in between, we need to do this to bring it up. No, it wasn't that way. All they would say is, oh, yeah, it's a chemical imbalance in the brain, and that's exactly what the drug representatives were telling them, and that's exactly what they were taught when they were going through medical school because the pharmaceutical companies had major influence over what was being taught there. And and back in the 1930s, the Rockefellers and, and uh, the guy who Standard Oil, that, that – they made it illegal to teach anything in medical school that wasn't associated with pharmacology, some pharma, pharmacological cure. So they knocked out electrotherapy, they locked out naturopathy, they knocked out aromatherapy, all these other therapies. It was illegal for them to teach that in medical school. And if they advised the patient to go seek one of these other treatments, they were, they were, Met, their license was taken away. So here's these billionaires determining what is going to be taught in medical school. And one of the things they taught in medical school was schizophrenia is due to a chemical imbalance. But they didn't even know what that imbalance was. You'd ask them, well, what's imbalanced? Well, we think it's serotonin. There's a correlation between the depletion of serotonin and schizophrenia. A correlation. There's also a correlation between schizophrenia it's drinking milk and schizophrenia there's a one-to-one -one correlation you know it, it's like it, it it's nuts what they're doing I, I mean if you were a caveman and you saw a car and and you noticed that every time that car moved that the wheels turned you'd be going hey there's a one-to-one -one correlation between that car moving and that wheel turning so it must be the wheel that's making that car turn you know make it go I mean there's there's hundreds of processes in between that are coming down to make that wheel turn before it actually turns. You know, and here's, here's the pharmaceutical industry and, and psychiatry and, and the whole medical establishment saying, oh, yeah, there's a, here, there's a correlation between the depletion of serotonin and some of these other drugs, and, and, and so it must be a chemical imbalance. But they don't have a single iota of proof you know, that's just a, a matter of fact, it has been staunchly disproved at this point. It is a falsity, and they're still teaching it. If you go onto the Internet and you look up the cause of schizophrenia, it'll, the co drug companies who are making, by the way, $3.6 billion a year selling this toxic stuff, will still say, oh, well, it is believed that there is a uh, chemical imbalance, or it is thought that there is a chemical. They're still pushing it. You know, they don't want any interference with their bottom line. So, and, and certainly they're not about to believe that there is a disease in existence that does not have a physical cause. I mean, that's beyond their, <laughs> what they can conceive. So the first thing I noticed is here they are saying there's a chemical imbalance, but they don't know what it is. They have no way to measure it. They have no lab tests for it. They have no EKGs or EEGs or anything else that will 
definitively show that there's a chemical imbalance. And if there is a chemical imbalance, which of the 32 or so neurotransmitters in the brain are imbalanced? They have no way to measure it, but yet they're going out there and they're going, it's a chemical imbalance, and these drugs will, will set it right. No, they don't set it right. Matter of fact, they are toxic. You know, they, the people who take these things will get dry mouth, the sexual dysfunction, uh, they'll be nervous, they'll be jittery, they, they feel like they have syrup poured on their brain, they can't think straight. I mean, it's, it's a horrible, horrible drug. But it works as long as you're taking it. And each time you take it, you're destroying both brain cells and your peripheral nervous system. So it's rotting out these patients' peripheral nervous system. And with long-term use, it produces something called uh, uh, extrapyramidal syndrome. It's a, and, and, uh, it's, a, it's a involuntary shaking that they can't stop. And tardive dyskinesia, where their tongue darts out of their mouth, and, bleh, 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 and they can't stop that either. And it's permanent neurological damage. Now, of course, at the state hospital, I never saw a single psychiatrist ever tell a patient that this is the repercussions of long-term use of this because that wouldn't be in their best interest. You know, then the patient wouldn't take it, and then they'd have a, a management problem on their hands. So this stuff was first discovered. I mean, the, the pharmaceutical industry wants you to think that they have spent billions of dollars in the research of these drugs because they're making $3.6 billion a year on it, and they have to recover their profits. The truth is that those drugs were first discovered in dye laboratories in France you know, by accident. And the people working in these dye laboratories researching new dyes found that this compound would make them all sluggish and, and whizzed out. And uh, uh, one, of the, uh, I, I, one of the people who noticed that went and told a doctor, and, and, and he went and he tried this on some psych patients. They wouldn't have any of it in, in Europe because they were into psychoanalysis analysis at the time. They didn't want to hear anything about psychopharmacology. So this French guy came over here and arranged for this medication to be given to patients on a, in a psych hospital. And lo and behold, they found out it calmed them down considerably. And they weren't as much of a problem. Uh, and that was a way to manage you know, psychotic patients without having to fight them and wrestle them down and, and wrap them up into uh, these, these straitjackets. Because in those battles, both sides were being hurt. You know, the uh, attendants were getting, you know, black eyes and broken bones, and so were the patients. I mean, it was a battlefield. But uh, with, the, with the inception of these drugs, I mean, it just knocked them silly. It, it calmed them out. And they found out that it also reduced um, psychotic symptoms. So their voices significantly lessened. So they went, oh, well, there must be some chemical cause for this because there's a one-to-one -one correlation between us giving them these uh, uh, antipsychotic drugs, which were major tranquilizers, the, the first of which was Thorazine, which is a very rough drug. <laughs> very rough drug. I mean, you wouldn't want to take, nobody in their right mind would want to take that stuff. Uh, uh, nobody would abuse it. Um, but what they, what they found is the patients wouldn't stay on it. So that was my first clue that something was off. Here they kept pushing this chemical imbalance, which they had no proof for. They had no measurement for. Um, and, and they had no lab work. So, you know, what's going on here? You know, wh wh why are they doing this when they have no proof? Well, today it's been proved repeatedly that there is no chemical imbalance. You know, they couldn't find one. They've been looking for one for uh, ever since modern medicine began some 300 years ago. They haven't found it. So they went from, from there to blaming the mother. Oh, it's something the mother did. I mean, here's psychiatry. The, the mother didn't feed the patient right, or the mother abused the patient. Or, and so here they are traumatizing all these mothers, and they had no evidence for that either, other than, to, you know, hey, my mom treated me bad. And, and indeed, when you start talking to these guys, a lot of them got very bad treatment as children. 
I mean, they were traumatized. So I could see where they'd make that link. So here was another correlation. But then here were a bu another body that weren't abused, and they still had the same symptoms. So they couldn't find any solid proof for that. So they moved to uh, – what's the next thing they moved to? It was uh, – I think it might, it might have been the chemical imbalance, and now they're on genes. Now, now they're trying to find some genetic marker, and they're going, oh, well, there's a correlation between gene 32A and schizophrenia. You know, here they are again. Um, yeah, let's use CRISPR, and I will edit that out for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I thought they drive me nuts. Mm -hmm. So, and at what point did you decide to encourage the patients to talk about their voices and what they are hearing? I think that was after one of the common things that, that I saw uh, in working with these uh, schizophrenic patients was that their voices would often tell them to kill themselves. You know, they were, they were no good. Um, and, and they didn't talk much about that, but, and, and they were very hesitant to talk about their voices because every time they did, the psychiatrist would jack up their medicines. So they, you know, they're like, oh, well, wait a minute, this stuff's bad enough at the level I got, you know, and if I start talking about it and, and this guy tells psychiatry that I'm still hearing these things, you know, they're going to, increase my, my medications until I can't even think straight or get out of bed. And, and that's kind of what happened. You know, oh, you're still hearing voices? Well, here, take another dose of this stuff, you know, until, until you're just kind of like a walking zombie. So they kind of kept that to themselves. And the last person that they would want to tell about their voices is somebody like me, you know, who worked for the establishment and had a close tie with psychiatry. And indeed, we were kind of like the watchdogs for psychiatry. Hey man, this guy's causing problems, or I think this guy's off his meds, or uh, so. Here were the voices, you know, in several cases, telling them to kill themselves. And matter of fact, a lot of them did. Um, I got some statistics on that somewhere, but I think it was uh, four out of ten attempted. Um, let me see if I can find the stats for that. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, that's a drug. I have to tell you about that, too. So suicide's a leading cause of death in schizophrenics. Four out of ten will attempt to kill themselves. Um, their suicide rate is estimated to be five to ten times that of the general population. Um, so you kind of go, well, what is this thing telling them to kill themselves? Um, and if the psychiatrist heard that, you know, somebody reported to them that the voices are telling this patient to kill themselves, right away they're put on suicide watch, it's treated as a serious threat, they're locked up, uh, they're, they're drugged up, they're filled with antidepressants and antipsychotics, and, and they're put in a, in a room where they can't hurt themselves until they're no longer suicidal. Uh, in the prison, what they would do is strip them down and put them in these, you know, these awful suicide blankets, which was kind of like a, a blanket with plastic, tough plastic sewed in, and that's all they would have. I mean, they would put them in there naked, and it was more a punishment for being suicidal than it was at any kind of treatment. And they'd keep them in these suicide cells until they were no longer suicidal. <laughs> So not many people wanted to be suicidal in the prison, uh, but the suicide rate there was pretty horrendous. So the psychiatrists would act as if the voices were real and there was something substantial to them when they heard that the voices were telling these patients to kill themselves. They would react like, you know, somebody stuck them with a hot poker and they, okay, lock him up and order these medications and don't let him out until he's not suicidal anymore. But anything else the patient tried to tell them about what the voices were saying were completely blown off as hallucinations. You know, oh, that's just crazy hallucinatory nonsense. 
you know, I mean, it's just garbage. What's happening with you is that, you know, your brain is broken. You've got a chemical imbalance. You've got to take these awful meds for the rest of your life. Uh, and if you stop, the voices will come back and you will get suicidal again. And then we'll have to lock you up again. Um, you know, so it, it's like, okay, why are they treating the voices in that case where they're telling the patient to kill themselves as real and reacting to them as real, but anything else the patient tells them that these voices are saying is considered to be a stupid, crazy hallucination due to a chemical imbalance that they've never been able to prove. I'm like, well, ain't that a little bit odd? Yeah. And so I started asking uh, tons of different staff. I mean, psych nurses, regular nurses, doctors and psychiatrists, you know, what's the cause of schizophrenia? Oh, oh, it's a chemical imbalance. It's like they all were put through the same machine. They all believed it. And, I, and when I first got there, I believed it too. But, I'm, you know, I never trusted authority. I mean, I never. <laughs> Even since I was a kid, I mean, I had it hammered into me time after time by different experiences that you can't trust authority. Um, and, and one of the – I'll tell you a story about one of the first things that I ran into – and in, in, this is when I was undergraduate school in psychology. Um, they assigned us a reading assignment from a, that was written by a psychologist. And I didn't know at that time that 90% of what psychologists write is not repeatable. They just expected you to believe it. And, of course, none of us psych students had any clinical experience. We couldn't counter anything. We were expected to believe it. We had no option. You believe it. You write it down on the test to show us you believe it. And and then we'll give you your degree if you believe enough of this nonsense. <laughs> That's what you had to do. So I remember this one reading assignment. It stuck in my head. It was uh, some psychologist writing about what would happen if two psychotic patients met each other with the same delusion. You know? And they said one of them would have to give way and choose another delusion. And even as an undergraduate student, I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, okay, you got two crazy people that are insane. Why, why would one of them have to give up their delusion so this other guy could have his delusion? And that stuck in my mind. I said, that just doesn't make any sense to me at all. So uh, run it up like, uh, you know, probably another, what was it? Maybe probably another 15 years or so maybe 10, but uh, here I am doing my rounds in the uh, psychiatric hospital, and I hit the second floor, and uh, you know, I'm looking for new patients and checking on the old ones, and here's this new guy that I hadn't seen before who's kind of walking around shuffling, you know, so it looked like he, he'd been hit by that uh, antipsychotic med long enough to where his neurological system was impaired, and he's talking, carrying on a conversation with himself, and I kind of kind of creep up on him and, and try to listen. And it was a coherent conversation. It was like hearing one side of a phone call. It wasn't word salad. It wasn't random garbage. He was actually talking to something or someone that I couldn't see and carrying on a conversation with them and, and responding to whatever they were saying and arguing with them whatever it was, and, uh, you know, he saw me coming up, and uh, I said, uh, hey, I hadn't seen you before. Um, what's your name? And he looks at me and goes, I'm Jesus Christ. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah? And uh, it's like I thought back to this psychology article back in undergraduate school, and I look at him, and I said, no, no, you can't be Jesus Christ because I am. You know, and I'm like, okay, what's he going to do? <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there watching him, you know, like just on pins and needles to, you know, like, okay, where's he going to go with this? And, uh, you know, none of the other staff saw me, otherwise I'd probably be in trouble. But, uh, you know, I, I was always operating below their, that level anyway. And he thinks about it and he stops and he's like, and then he looks at me and he goes, uh, okay, we can both be Jesus Christ. And he turns around, he walks off. And I said, shoot, if they lied to me about that, what else did they lie to me about? 
you know, and, and there was a series of things like that. And the problem is that undergraduate students cannot access a psychiatric population unless you jump through their hoops. And it's like they got these people locked up, and you can't study them, and they're not studying them. And this schizophrenia is supposed to be a thought disorder, and they haven't done a single solitary thought uh, study on, on the thought, the thinking of these people. Matter of fact, they don't ask the question, where do thoughts come from? And when I was in the doctoral program, I was starting to, it was like two years of this crazy stuff. You know, I had almost a straight A average and I was really getting sick of it. And it was like boot camp for, uh, it was this dense programming that, I mean, they were changing me and I didn't want that. I didn't want to be changed that way. But what I was after was thinking that they knew where thoughts come from and that they were just hiding that. You know, they were waiting for, people to, to go through the ranks and get their master's and undergraduate and then get up there and then they would tell you where thoughts come from. So here was this uh, lecture that um, uh, the head of the psychology department was giving to second year students and he was actually teaching us how to lie with statistics and I was shocked. I mean a formal course on how to lie with statistics. I mean, here he was giving us a personal, and, and, and I raised my hand, and, and what he was doing was treating the bottom 5% of a normal curve as if it were an entirely different population and not connected with the rest of the population, the, the overall population. He's treating it as a separate population. And I raised my hand, and I said, well, how can you do that? And, and I'll never forget his, his answer. He looked at me and he goes, well, you know, if they're too stupid to, to know what, what I'm doing, that's their problem. And I was just shocked. I just absolutely shocked. And I, I look at the other students and they're just sitting there going, oh, that's how it's done. But there was one guy that I was good friends with. I look at him and he just kind of looks at me. He's in shock too. And then we had to turn back and look back at the professor before he saw us kind of looking at one another going, what's going on here? Yeah. So I figured, okay, look, at the end of that lecture, he goes, does anybody have any questions over anything? And I raised my head that I go, uh, yeah, uh, t t tell me where, where do thoughts come from? And he looked at me like I just asked him, where does a candle flame go when you blow it out? And he's just staring at me like stunned, like nobody asks these kind of questions. Who is this guy, you know? And he doesn't answer. And a after staring at me for like 10 seconds, he goes, well, I'll come and talk to me after the, after the lecture. So I go to talk to him after the lecture, and he kind of scoots out of there. And I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble again. Um, so here you got a thought disorder that, that nobody's looking at the thoughts. You know? And they, they can't even conceive of it. I mean, here's a, it's supposed to be one of the best psychology PhD programs in the country, and they're not even asking the question. So I think your original question was like, how did I start suspecting this? Okay, so the foundations were already rotten before I got into the state hospital. And there it was, the unwritten rule was you don't upset psychotic patients for any reason. And asking them questions about their voices upset them. You know, the voices would right away kick up and I found out later when I was working with uh, prisoners, several times the voices came up and told them, shut up, don't tell him anything, he already knows too much. I mean, I'm hearing this time after time after time from different patients with different voices. And it's like, you know, but that's years after I, I, I hit this other thing. And then the other strange things I was seeing was, you know, doing my rounds in the uh, psychiatric rehab center and every time the chaplain had a ice cream social down in the main meeting area, all my schizophrenics were on the ward. You know, here, so here they are sitting on this dingy ward instead of going down there and eating ice cream and cake, which were hard to get hold of there. 
And I'm like, well, that's odd. And I saw that time after time. And then I started asking them, you know, well, why are you staying up here? Why aren't you down there with the other guys getting ice cream and cake? Well, I don't like church and I don't like preachers. And uh, that's a bunch of crap. And, uh, and it was consistent. It was like, uh, you know, so I started asking them some questions about, well, why is this? And periodically I'd hit the voices get louder when I go into those places, when I go into the churches. So I started wondering, well, you know, I never took the word of just one patient. I would take the question I asked and then start asking. I had an unlimited supply of schizophrenics there. So I'd start asking these others. And time after time, they'd say, well, yeah, the voices don't like the Bible. They hate the 23rd Psalm. When I read the 23rd Psalm, they act like worms thrown onto a hot frying pan. And I'm like, whoa. So I started handing out the 23rd Psalm. And I got the same response. You know, all these patients said the voices hate it. They hate when I read the Bible. They, uh, I said, well, what did they tell you? And they said, well, Jesus couldn't even uh, protect himself. What makes you think he's going to protect you? And this is the voices telling them this thing. And I'm like, this is a hallucination. You know, the, you know, hallucinations are supposed to be random. I mean, they're supposed to be all over the place. They're, you know positive, negative, neutral. I mean, just uh, you know, there's just no pattern. The pattern was that these voices were consistently negative, consistently. They never told the patient anything good unless it was to get them in trouble later on. So I'm like, well, that's odd. What kind of hallucination would tell a patient to kill himself? What kind of hallucination would tell him to not go to church? So I started studying that search phenomena and, and asking all these patients, like, what do the voices do when you go to church? You know, and a lot of them said, I never go to church. But of the ones that did, they broke up into three categories. The ones where the voices would get louder before they went, saying, this is a bunch of crap, you're wasting your time, don't go there, and do everything they could to convince them not to go to church. But once they got in there, the voices shut up. So those were the weaker voices. Then there were the moderate ones where the patient would go in there and he, they would try to listen to what the preacher was saying. And they would get louder as the, the patient was trying to listen to what the message that the preacher was giving. Then they blotted out. They'd, they'd get louder and say, this is garbage. You know, get out of here. You're wasting your time. Da -da -da. And, then, and they'd, they'd flare up. And then the worst ones the ones with the strongest voices, they would be driven completely out. They would jump up and run out of the church right in the middle of the sermon. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty odd behavior for a hallucination. You know? So and right away there were all these things that just didn't make sense. And uh, so, so I, I began questioning patient after patient about their voices, and the voices didn't like that. <clears throat> And they would get yeah, periodically, they'd convince the patient to go. And this is while I was working in the state hospital. They'd convince the patient to go complain to the psychiatrist. And I'd get pulled up before the psychiatrist on the red carpet. And, and you know, you don't be upsetting my patients. I have enough trouble without you upsetting them and causing them all this trouble. And, and you're just reinforcing their hallucinations by asking about them. And if I catch you doing this again, I'm going to report you to the, the administrator. And I'm like, <laughs> like my yeah, so you weren't even allowed to ask the patients about the, what these things were and how they behaved without running into flack from these guys. And I ran into that two or three times you know, where I was threatened. Like, you know, you keep causing, uh, causing problems by asking these guys about voices and upsetting them. We're going to have to take action on you. And I'm like, shoot, they're not asking themselves. They, they don't care. They think they're hallucinations. By then, I suspected they weren't, but I didn't want to believe they were anything else. I mean, I, I was in denial too, so I'm like, okay, they're not acting like hallucinations, but I'm thinking, well, maybe there's some facet of the guy's subconscious, you know, that, that are kicking in there, and, and uh, you know, I, I just didn't want to believe that they were something separate, you know, something but they were consistently negative and they ran a consistent pattern that I thought I saw that wasn't, you know, it wasn't 
random like you would expect from a hallucination. It was what what is it that was holding these voices on a consistent negative pattern? What confined them to negative, upsetting verbiage? Why weren't they just all over the place? Why were the, what held them on to just abusing and and mocking the patient and telling them all kinds of bad things and telling them they kill themselves you know what was doing that yeah you know, so but I, I even all the way through seven years at the state hospital i still was in denial well past the point where i had plenty of evidence that there was something coming in from outside that was causing this i didn't want to see it i didn't want to believe it i i, I just you know, kind of blotted. It, it's something's wrong with their subconscious mind. I mean, it's like, um, so by the time I got out of there, I had a strong suspicion that the voices were not hallucinations, that they were something else, but I wasn't really sure what they were. Then I noticed that virtually every schizophrenic who was put on these medications would eventually go off and go psychotic again and I'm like well you know why is that happening but the, you know and, and I'd ask them and they'd all say well it's it's the side effects the, the side effects are awful and they were but what didn't make sense is when you compare the side effects which were bad to going insane and becoming you know, floridly psychotic it was like okay which do you want you want you want you want the flu or you want the bubonic plague and they were all choosing the bubonic plague and i'm like well, why are you choosing the plague you know, and i'd ask them well, why i mean which is worst and, and they'd say well well the plague's worst and i'm like well what am i missing here what is it they don't understand you know, why, why are they consistently, and almost all, this happened with almost all of them, at one time or another, they'd stop taking their meds. And, and yeah, that was true that the, and, and I asked the staff, I said, well, why, why do you think they stopped taking their meds? And, and it's like they want to go psychotic, and, and that's much worse than the side effects. And, oh, uh, well, uh, uh, that's just a symptom of schizophrenia. I'm like, a, a symptom of schizophrenia. And they didn't even want to know why they weren't even curious you know, well, it's just a symptom of all uh, this craziness they have they do crazy things and they do do crazy things i mean they, they do they do do crazy things so well, i came up with this questionnaire and it it had uh you know write down all the all the nasty side effects that you've experienced from your antipsychotic meds so not all of them have the same side effects. So I'd give them a blank piece of paper, said, write, write down every bad side effect you've experienced from your meds. And then I went to the DSM, I think it was a three at the time, and I wrote down all the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia, which were like two pages of awful, awful symptoms, you know, suicidal thoughts, uh, hallucinations, nightmares, uh, uh, demons attacking you. Uh, I mean, it was just all these awful symptoms. And uh, after I got back the sheet of, of you know, the um, side effects, I'd hand them all these symptoms from the DSM-3, and I'd say, which I want you to check each one of these that you've experienced. All right, so they sat there, and they check them all off. And there were a ton of them that, that, that they checked. And then I'd hand them both back and I'd say, well, uh, which one's worse? And they go, well, the, going psychotic is worse. Well, then why do you keep going off your meds? And you know what they'd say? Every single one of them. When, when giving that right in front of them where they could see the objective data, the subjective data, they would say, I don't know. And that went on for like three years. And I didn't stop asking them. I'm like, well, the staff don't know. You know, I haven't got any kind of decent answer from any of the staff, any of the psychiatrists, any of the psych nurses. 
they don't know why they keep going off their meds other than the side effects. But then when you rule out the side effects, what's going on? It's like, again, it's like they're choosing the bubonic plague over the flu. I mean, it's not, both choices are bad. <laughs> but, but one is much worse, and they're consistently choosing the very worst one. Uh, and they don't know why they're doing it. And so it's like, uh, Three years, I, may, three or more years, I kept asking the same question over and over again. And, and I started feeling crazy because you start, you know, you ask the same question over and over again, and you get the same answer, you know, that doesn't make sense over and over again. It's like expecting a different result, and it's not coming. So it, it was my last year at the state hospital. And one little gal got into trouble. She went off her meds. She was doing good in classes. She was going to cosmetology class. And she was doing good while she was on her meds. She went off her meds for the third time. And they were about to discharge her from the program because if they won't stay on their meds, they're not going to be able to function. They're not going to be able to work. Um, so <clears throat> she went off her meds for the third time. And they were fixing the discharger from the program thinking, well, if you can't stay on your meds, you're not going to be able to work and we're wasting our time and money on you. And her mother calls me from, this was South Georgia, and says, you know, please don't discharge her. Let me come up there and talk to her on Friday with you. Let's see if we can't find out what's going on. And, and you know, I can't handle her at home. And, and I tried this before on my own and it's not working and I can't deal with this. I'd like to meet with you and her on Friday. And I said, okay come on up, and uh, on Friday afternoon, we all three of us were up there, and her mother and I are asking her why. This is the third time you went off your meds, and every time you did that, you went insane. Why do you keep doing it? And, and she goes, I, I'm not sure I want to tell you. you know, and I'm like, well, you know, we got to know something, otherwise we can't keep you in the program. Are you going to keep doing this? And I said, why, why after three times, each time you having to be re-hospitalized because you went psychotic, why do you keep doing this? And she said, because the voices told me that those medicines were poison. And I don't know how many times I've heard that from psychotic patients. A psychiatrist is poisoning me. They're trying to kill me. They're poisoning me. It, that was a common excuse. And psychiatrists indeed were attacked at many times the rate of any other doctor or any other staff at the hospital. And I have that assault rate there. The assault rate for all jobs was 12.6 assaults per 1,000 workers. The assault rate on doctors, medical doctors, other than psychiatrists, was 16.2 per 1,000. The assault rate for uh, custody staff, that's attendants who are around these, these guys 24 hours a day. I mean, so here you have attendant staff 24 hours a day. Their assault rate was 69 per 1,000. They're with them all the time. And the assault rate for psychiatrists was 65 per 1,000. So 65 compared to you know, 16.2 for regular doctors. What's going on there? You know, so that clicked. Okay, these patients are assaulting psychiatrists because they believe these medications are poison, and here's the voices telling them that they're being poisoned and that psychiatrists are being attacked. And another thing that was really strange you know, we, we talked about the suicide rate of um, schizophrenics. It was, uh, I, th I think it was about 5.4 times. No, let me see what it was exactly. Suicide rate. Well, it was about 5 to 10 times that of the normal population. Now, you look at the suicide rate of psychiatrists. It's 5.9 times higher than that of the general population. Ain't that interesting? And that comes from the Journal of Medical uh, 
JMA here in uh, the medic one of the big medical journals over here in the U.S. So here you have an, a, a suicide rate with regard to psychiatrists that is <laughs> equivalent to that of schizophrenics. So what's going on there? So it, it gets stranger as you go along. <laughs> and, and the real stuff started coming out when I got to uh, uh, working at the state prison with, with schizophrenics there. What they did is they closed down all the state hospitals in the U.S. and threw all these guys out on the street and saying, okay, uh, we're going to set up a series of mental health centers all over all over the state and you go there and get your medications. But they, they wouldn't even take their medications when they were handed them and to them at the state hospital and when they were being monitored there, there's no way they're going to voluntarily go to a mental health center and, and and pick up meds there you know half of them don't have transportation and the ones that do aren't going to want to take that stuff so they're not going to take it they're going to go psychotic and then they're going to get in trouble and they're either going to be hospitalized or they uh, they can't hold a job they, so the only real option they have is to turn to crime or to beg you know, so a lot of these guys you see on the street corners are schizophrenics that are trying to just survive. And if they can't survive that way, they have to turn to crime. And when they turn to crime, they get thrown in the prison. So here you have an entire psychiatric population that used to be held in state hospitals at a fraction of the cost of what it costs to keep them in a prison that have been now transferred into the prisons where they now have have to have security and and guards watching them and and it, it's much more expensive to keep them in a prison but the advantage to me was that in the prison you you're running out of time or you know, in, 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 in the prison if a schizophrenic got upset because a psych was asking him about the voices and went to complain to anybody, they would laugh at them. Like that, that didn't even break the ambient noise level there. So I could ask them all the questions I wanted, and they could complain all they wanted if they did that, and nobody would listen to them. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know, I was able to collect a group of schizophrenics that I trusted and they trusted me, and we would try different things that would see what impact it had on their voices. And consistently, the reading of any positive spiritual material would set off a furor with, with the voices. They did not like that. They didn't want them doing that. The reaction to the 23rd Psalm was consistent. It always upset the voices. They always went off and started complaining about it. Um, and and still, even at, at that point, you know, I, I still was in denial that these things were something separate. I just, you know, I didn't want to believe that. And here they are giving me mounds of information that countered that thinking, but I just, <laughs> I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to believe it. Um, so as we came up with more and more, and, and, and the the ground rule I operated with while in the prison was whatever upsets the voices is they don't like it. It's bad for them. So give them a double dose of it. Now, if I did that at the state hospital, they'd be all over me like they were. Well, you're upsetting the patients with your questions and, and we don't need them upset. But you know, in the prison, everybody's upset anyway. <laughs> all the prisoners are upset. All the staff is upset. It's just, you know, it's, it's not a very fun place to be. But for the investigation of the voices, it was a perfect place to be. Mm -hmm. for a while. From, your, from your experience, uh, what did these patients have in common? Did they have a common history, let's say, drug abuse, alcohol abuse? Because I think there is a link between too much alcohol abuse and entity infestation. Did you experience that? Yeah, I think you're exactly right there. The, the first link I saw uh, was most of them had suffered horrible abuse of one kind or another as, as children or as young adults. So there, there was this abusive background, not all of them, but a great majority of them. So 
that was fairly consistent all the way through. The second thing I noticed later was amphetamine kind of like opened the door to these things. I'm, more prisoners were sent to prison for committing crimes while they were psychotic on amphetamine than any other drug that I ever saw. You know, so it, it's like it opened the door to to psychosis. You know, it it triggered psychosis, and it was like they were going psychotic, and and it was like once they became psychotic, they stayed psychotic. It didn't go away. But what was tricky about it is when they first started. You know, they'd start hearing these voices. They'd go, oh well, I'm just hallucinating because of the drug, and they're thinking well, okay, you know, it'll go away. And, and they stop using the drug and it does go away. And that happens for many times. And then one day they use it and it doesn't go away. They're there and they can't get rid of them and they're there forever. And they, it, 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 they're now psychotic. You know, whatever these things were, they, they invaded. So I started asking questions about uh, uh, amphetamine. And these people would see something called the shadow people consistently. They were three-dimensional shadows um, that would enter their rooms at night, follow them around, and, and usually show up at the foot of their bed and be staring down at them. They never spoke. Um, and I, I noticed, and I actually use this clinically, if they saw their eyes, they were in much worse shape than if they didn't. The majority of them never saw the eyes. If they did see eyes on these shadow people, they were either lime green or they were red. Neither color is not something I'd want to meet somebody with eyes of that color. I mean, right away, it just kind of sends chills up your back. And these shadow people would walk through the walls. They would never speak. Um, if the prisoner paid attention to them, they would start moving in on them. You know. oh, they weren't anything good because they'd always scare the person. But I never saw them or heard of them doing any physical harm. I've had some patients say I could feel them walk through me because they could walk through walls. You turn on the light and they were instantly gone. And then I ran into one patient, uh, one prisoner one day that he said that he ran an experiment to see if he couldn't figure, get more information about what they were. And right away I perked up. It's like, well, yeah, what was it? What'd you do? So this is when he was outside of the prison and, and him and his friend were heavily using amphetamine and they wanted to see if they had to be on amphetamine to see these things. So what they did is they got a bunch of amphetamine. They drove out to the Indian reservation cells out here, south of here at night, <clears throat> late at night and went down this dirt road and one of them shot up with amphetamine and started seeing the shadow people. So he'd ask the other one, well, okay, I see one over there by that tree. You see him? No, no, I don't see him. Well, okay, there's another one coming up from the back over there. You see him? No, I don't see him. So they determined that the guy who was on the amphetamine could see these shadow people, and the other guy who wasn't at the time couldn't. So they both shot up. Now they wanted to see if they were both seeing the same ones. And I'm finding this fascinating. I'm sitting there on the edge of my seat listening to his story. And, and he would said, well, okay, he'd point to one over there, and he'd ask his friend, you see that one over there? Yeah, I see him. Well, what's he doing? Well, he's hiding behind that bush over there. You know, so they determined that they were both seeing the same thing. They were both seeing the same shadow people. Now, one thing that happens when you're paying attention to these things is they start coming toward you. And I don't know why they do that but it's pretty scary. And uh, so what he said is that as they were watching these guys and they were kind of, you know, focused on, you know, kind of comparing notes uh, about what they were both seeing, they determined they were both seeing the same thing. These things were coming out of the desert at them and began surrounding them. And they looked at that and they got scared and they jumped in their truck and locked the doors. So here they are watching these things from outside the truck, and their truck was completely surrounded by these things, three-dimensional shadows in the, in the shape of human beings without eyes, just milling around out there. And then he said the back of the truck went down as if somebody dropped a huge boulder in it, 
and the front went up and they turned around and the whole back of the bed was full of shadow people. And I asked him, I said, well, what'd you do? And he said, well, we started the truck and we almost wrecked it getting out of there. And I asked him, I said, uh, did they follow you? And he said, no, they didn't. And, you know, I could sense he wasn't lying. Why, why would a prisoner tell something like that to a psych? <laughs> You know, <laughs> you'd have to be nuts to do that. You know, it, it's like you just don't tell psychs that kind of stuff. And uh, he wasn't—he wasn't crazy at the time I was talking to him. You know, he was sane. But what—what what kind of bothered me about that story was the back of the truck going down because I didn't think these things could could affect physical reality. You know, I thought that whatever they were, they lived in the guy's head. Yeah. And they, they weren't talking to, none of these shadow people were talking to this guy. You know. But here's this other dimension that sent the back of this truck down and the front up. And what bothered me about that is my belief was that they could not affect physical reality. That whatever they were, they were stuck in the patient's head and they couldn't go out, you know, because they, you know, I couldn't hear them. None of the other staff could hear them. Uh, yeah, you know, I got to where later on, when I was working in the emergency rooms doing psych crisis, where I could feel their presence and I could feel it strongly. But back then, I couldn't. Um, and the fact that this guy's reporting that they could affect physical reality, I'm kind of wondering, you know, well, you know, that's I don't like that. But I just kept it in the back of my mind. And and. Uh, at that point, I knew, let me see, yeah, I knew that they were, they were, uh, and, and I don't think those shadow people were the same as the voices. They were something else, uh, but they were spooky. Um, but what, what really broke me was the stories that a lot of these prisoners were telling. The first one that we worked on, the first breakthrough I got where we actually got rid of the voices was this guy who used to work on Wall Street. And uh, he had a, you know, like a, making tons of money. Uh, and he started using a lot of meth and, he, and, and amphetamine. And then he started hearing voices. And he was, he was married for years and he was hearing voices for years and his wife never noticed. And I said, well, how did that happen? How could she not tell? And he goes, well, I'd go out into the garage and I'd just talk to him myself. And she'd catch me and, and I'd just tell her I was just talking to myself. So the voices didn't like his wife. They don't like wives. They hate little kids. You know, they hate the person being in any relationship. What they want to do is poison any relationship so they have the victim all by themselves where they can't get any help. So they were always bad mouthing his wife. And uh, at one point she asked for a divorce and he was relieved. You know, he was happy. And when she saw that, she went ballistic. She just took him to the cleaners. And he ended up without a house, without a job, on the streets in New York City, living in Central Park, covered with newspapers and, and knowing which restaurant garbage cans to live and eat out of. And he liked that. You know, that's, that's how he wanted to live. It was very simple, and, and he had his voices, and, and uh, he was comfortable that way. And I'm like, whoa. And uh, he came to group one day, and, and uh, I started working with him. He was one of the chosen guys. And finally, when I learned enough about how to get rid of these things, you know, his voices one day in, in, in the office, when we tried this last thing, they disappeared and they screamed as they left. They, they were screamed and he sat there stunned and he almost fell out of his chair. And I'll never forget his words. He turned at me and he looked and he said, um, uh, the silence is deafening. Because it was the first time in decades he had not heard the voices. They weren't talking. They were gone. And he was in shock. He couldn't move. He couldn't stand up. He couldn't get out of the chair. He just sat there like, you know. 
so I'd check on him every once in a while after that, <clears throat> told him, hey, listen, you need to stay on a positive spiritual path, otherwise these things are going to come back. He didn't do that. And uh, he got a job working with the motor vehicle section of the prison there where he was answering phones. So one day as I was about to, I was being transferred to another unit. You know, the chief psychologist found out that I was asking prisoners about voices. This was toward the end of the years I, I was working there. And he, he was transferring me to a Spanish unit. And my Spanish is atrocious. I mean, I can get by, but there, you can't do therapy with the level of Spanish I know. So I stopped by and visited this guy on the way out while I was uh, leaving that unit. And I said, how are you doing? You, you still hearing the voices? And he goes, uh, uh, yeah. I said, well, what happened? He said, uh, I was so lonely, I called them back. He called them back. And he was hearing them, you know, while he was working on the on the phones. So at that point, I, I learned enough to be able to help the patient, teach the patient how to get rid of these things. And uh, there was another one, uh, one of the guys I was working with intensely, uh, who would, you know, and one of the requirements I had for them was, listen, I'll, I'll go out of my way to help you. I'll, I'll bail you out of whatever trouble you get into. But I want you to tell me in live time as we sit here what those voices are telling you as we're speaking and their reaction to what I'm saying. And the ones I was, I always had a group of them, maybe, you know, 10 or 17 that I was working with. And, and there were, there were tons of them that didn't want to do that. They, they wouldn't agree to do anything like that. But I always had a group the whole time I was at the prison where they were different ones, but they always agreed to do that. So here's this one guy. He's getting better and better and better. The voices are getting less and less and less. So he comes in one day and he said, the voices are really getting pissed at you. They're really angry with you. And I'm like, oh, you got a hallucination who's getting angry with me? And he goes, yeah, yeah, they're really upset with you. They don't want me coming here. They're saying you're crazy, you're stupid, don't listen to anything you say. Um, they're really getting angry. They don't want me coming here. And I said, well, that's weird. Yeah. And so he kept coming because he was getting better. And I, we kept working. And, and then he comes in one day and... Let me see, what did he say next? He comes in one day without an appointment. So I figure he's in trouble. And he knocks on my door and he goes, uh, he comes in the office and he says, the voices want to talk to you. And I'm like, they want to talk to me personally? And that this has never happened before. And bef all the other interactions, the, I said, what are the voices saying? Well, they're telling me this. So it always went through the patient. They were always telling me what the voices were telling them. And the voices never came out and talked to me personally. But here he is telling me, the voices want to talk to you personally. And I'm like, you know, what? He goes, yeah, they want to speak to you. And I'm like taken aback, you know. So here, here's more evidence that these things are not, you know, some figment of, of of the unconscious. So he comes in, he sits down. And I said, "Well, what is it they have to say?" And I'll never forget this. You know, his voice change, his voice tone changes, a, just a little bit lower. And these words come out of his mouth. You have no right to interfere with our way of life. And I'm like, bam. <laughs> you know? And he said, that wasn't me. That wasn't me saying that. You know? And I'm like, what the blazes is going on here? It was at that point, you know, after getting all this other information for years that my denial system, it was just hanging by tatters, completely collapsed. It just completely collapsed. And I was stunned. And, and I'm like, oh, what is going on here? So I canceled my appointments for the rest of the day, and I'm trying to sort this out. I'm drawing blanks. 
And it's like, what just happened? So I kept working with that guy. I didn't back off because these things were, you know, I, I basically told him, you know, go soak your head somewhere or something. And he's getting better and better and better. And about that time, I was reading a book written by the shaman Michael uh, Miguel Ruiz, who was talking about these entities that enter people's minds and you know, tell them bad things and that they were energy parasites. Now, one thing I'd noticed was that every time these voices attacked a patient, their energy level would drop down to almost nothing. You know, and here they are laying in bed all night. They're not exerting themselves physically at all, but in the morning after being attacked by these things, they were so weak, a lot of them couldn't even get up to go eat breakfast. So here's this one-to-one -one correlation between these things being uh, attacking and their energy levels dropping to almost zero. So I see this correlation, and I ask, I start asking the, the patients about this. I said, do you, after the voices attack, do you experience a lack of energy? Do you feel like you're drained? Every single one of them would say yes. And I'd say, Where, where'd your energy go? Every single one of them would say, I don't know. Or the anxiety did it. So I was thinking for uh, uh, years that it was the, the massive amount of anxiety these voices create with their constant abuses and negativity and bashing and, and telling the patient to kill themselves and they're worthless and they're no good and, uh, you know, everybody's uh, against them and, and people are trying to kill them. I mean, that's anxiety provoking enough. But then one day I got called, I always got put in the, the nastiest, toughest units and I was assigned to the jail for the prison, which is where the worst of the worst went. So the, all, all the bad guys from the entire prison would go there. And one day I got a inmate letter from uh, a prisoner there who was saying, listen, uh, my roommate's crazy. He's hearing voices and he's, he's standing over me at three in the morning, just staring down at me and he's freaking me out. And, you know, I need, need you to do something to help me out here. I think he might kill me. You know? um, that guy was sent to the, the central detention unit because he had snitched off the, the white brotherhood, this big nasty gang that was smuggling drugs into the prison. And with the, the information he gave to administration, they busted the gang, took all their drugs, and they wanted him dead. They wanted him dead so bad that they sent some of their gang members over to got in trouble on purpose to get sent to CDU so they could have a chance to kill this guy. So they couldn't take him out of the cell without an escort because if any of the other ones could get at him, they would kill him. He'd already been stabbed by them previously. So that's why they put him there because they knew his life was at risk. And then he gets put in with this florid psychotic, you know, who's staring at him, hearing voices and staring down at him at three at night. You, you couldn't, be under much more stress than that you know here are these guys trying to kill you they're shooting notes under your door telling you you're a goner they're going to kill you the first chance they get and now you're locked into this tiny cell with a flaming psychotic so i go over there and they were both in the same cell and i, I call them out one by one and i'm watching as they're walking up the steps and i talk to the guy who the the gangsters are trying to kill first, and he just bolts up those steps. He had plenty of energy. He had plenty of energy in the interview. Um, and, you know, he coherent, and <clears throat> you know, he went back down. And then I called up the, the schizophrenic guy. He could barely make it up those steps. He had no energy. And throughout the interview, he was just so low energy that it was, I mean, he just was barely speaking. And after I finished that interview, I went, it's not anxiety. You know, it's not anxiety that is causing this. This, you know. So after that, I, I was reading Miguel Ruiz's book where he was talking about the energy drain that these entities cause to people he was working with. So I figured, okay, 
I'm going to smuggle this into the prison, and I'm the guy whose voices told me that I had no right to interfere with their way of life. I'm, I'm going to read this, what it says about the energy drain to him, and ask him what he thinks about it. And I did that often. I'd bring stuff in, and I'd, and I'd say, well, what, what do you think about what this guy's saying? You know? and, and I'd listen to them and take that into account. So here I bring this in. He comes in. He sits down. And I said, tell me what you think about what this, this guy's a shaman. Tell me what you think about what he's saying. And I start reading it to him. And uh, every once in a while, I glance up. And as I'm reading it, he's kind of staring at me, like with this strange look on his face. And then I hear this, this electrical crackle just explode from behind my head, like, a, like an arc welder. And it's like, it just sounds just like an arc welder. And I know that crackling sound. And I'm like, what the? devil is that and I turn around I don't see anything there and it starts moving up the wall at a 45 degree angle toward the ceiling at the back of the room and and this I look at this guy and he's just staring at me with these blank eyes you know just like a zombie he's just staring at me and I'm like what is going on here and it's like crack 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 all the way up the wall and and I'm trying to see what that is but I don't want to take my eyes off of him either because I'm suspecting he's going to attack you know, he's looking really strange and he's just staring at me in this odd way so I push my chair back against the wall so if he comes at me I could kick him back because they always had female guards manning the medical unit at that time and <laughs> if they had to do anything physical man, you were virtually on your own you know until somebody could get there and that might be 15 20 minutes so i push my chair back against the wall you know kind of halfway expecting him to attack from the strange look he had on his face and i'm trying to see whatever's making this noise and i couldn't see anything and i'm kind of i didn't want to take my eyes off him for too long so i'm going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and then it goes across the ceiling over his head so i can keep an eye on him and also search the ceiling and and it's I, I see nothing. I smell nothing. I just hear this crack, 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 crack. And then it starts coming down at a 45 degree angle toward me. And I'm like, <laughs> what is going on? And it jumps into this Rubbermaid trash can near my neck, left leg. And it's crackling in there. And I, I turn and I look down there briefly and I'm, I still don't want to take my eyes off him. And there's nothing in there. You know, the, the inmate porter had cleaned it last night, and there was nothing there except this crackling sound coming from this thing. And I asked the, I asked the guy, the prisoner, I said, do you, do you hear that? And he just, he didn't respond. He's just staring at me with these zombie-like eyes. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And, and then the sound stops, and he slowly gets up, and he goes, I got to leave. I'm thinking, like, yeah, get the hell out of here, man. <laughs> go, go, go. Yeah. So he goes down the hall, and I'm sitting there stunned. And I walk, and I search. I, I look closely at the walls, and there's no burns. There's no sign that anything ever happened. I can't account for what happened. I go out into the hall, and I check all the other doors, and, and none of the other staff, medical staff, are in yet. You know, the doctor's office is locked. The nurse's office is locked. Everything's locked. There was nothing that I could see that could account for that sound. And I was shocked. I was stunned. I just sat there, like, stunned. You know, like a, it's like I'd been hit by a taser or something. I, I couldn't think straight. It was like I, uh, my mind fogged out. And I'm thinking, if they can do that, if they can make the walls crackle, what else can they do? And what am I getting myself into here? You know? So they didn't like me, and I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> and it got stranger from there, but I'm not answering any of your questions. I'm just rambling on here. Yeah. Um, would you say that at the end of the day, this is what people call demonic attacks? I think you could say that because the way these things react is just like a demon would, you know. But what set them off, that last frenzy with the with the attacking, with the, with the, the electric snapping, was 
showing the patient or giving that patient the information that they were energy parasites because that's what Ruiz was talking about was that they drain your energy and I'd already seen a pattern of that among hundreds of them where they would say well yeah they after they after they come I'm drained and I, I would ask them well okay does this happen every time they come and they go well yeah and and I'd go well what do you think causes that and they consistently they'd say I don't know and I'd say well, if you stuck your hand in a fire, and every time you stuck your hand in the fire, you got burned, what's burning you? They had no trouble saying, well, it's a fire. And then I'd, I'd repeat, I'd said, well, if, if these voices come, and every time they come, you're drained of energy, what do you think is taking your energy? Well, I don't know. They were being blocked from that realization. You know, some of them got it. But most of them were not allowed. Something was interfering with their being able to see that. You know? And about that time, I was able to start feeling these things. And every time I would bring that up to a patient, I would feel this cold, icky electrical feeling just over my entire body. So I knew that's what it was. It was them. They were reacting to... That, that's the last thing they want a patient to know is that they are stealing their energy, but they have to turn it negative first. So that's why the, their messages are always shameful and, and disgusting and, and, and uh, uh, horrifying and negative. They have to turn their emotional state negative first before to generate negative energy before they can take it. And that's why they can't stand the person reading the Bible or going to church or reading any positive spiritual material because that's going in the opposite direction. Yeah. Um, so th th they're, they're friggin' energy parasites. And Swedenborg talks about that. Um, and they don't want that out. They do not want that information out. That's the last thing they want out. And the only reason these antipsychotic drugs work is because they calm these guys down. And when they're calm, it's much harder to get them upset. So basically, they then have to fight the drug to get the person upset, and they have to work a lot harder to do that. And, and still, the person, if they're on these, these powerful drugs, still will not get upset to the level that they are without it so the first thing they go after is those drugs they start telling the patient psychiatrist is poisoning you they get them to concentrate on the negative side effects and forget about what it's like to be psychotic yeah. so here's psychiatry going well oh yeah they, they, it must be a chemical imbalance because oh, drugs are chemical look what happens we give them these drugs and miraculously their symptoms you know, withdrawal. They they still hear them. I, they still most of them still hear the voices, but they're nowhere near as strong. They can get to sleep, the nightmares. So they really interfere with their being drained, and the voices don't like that. And so they get them to concentrate on. Well, look at now you're feeling. You know, you can't walk straight. You're groggy. You're you're nervous. You know, they get them to just concentrate on those negative side effects and tell them. Not to, not to take those drugs, but to go use alcohol, go use, uh, uh, get Percocet or, or something else, but don't take those drugs. You know? And alcohol is the same thing. I once had a, um, uh, this was an Apache Indian. I don't know if you know about Apaches, but they're, they're particularly fierce. I mean, they caused, uh, they killed a lot of people in the old days when the West was being settled out here. Uh, and he was he was so violent and and such an alcoholic that the uh, Apache police couldn't deal with him anymore up on the reservation up north. So they were sending him down to the uh, the prison, uh, and he was coming to the unit I was on. So I got I got warned of that, saying he's particularly violent. Uh, you know he may be psychotic. You may want to keep an eye on him when he gets here. So. I'm watching them. Usually, they'll send them to Alhambra, the the 
uh, classification center before they send him to a prison unit. This guy's just crashing through the system. I'm watching him on the computer. He's crashing. Boom, boom, boom. He's not stopping anywhere. He didn't go to classification. He, he didn't go anywhere else. He's just coming right through. And boom, he shows up at the unit. And, you know, I, I, I call him in as soon as he's settled in, and he comes in. He's this big guy. And he hates whites. I mean, you could tell just as soon as he walked into the office, the hatred just pouring off of him. And I could see him ramping up with each question I asked him. And I'm like, uh, okay, uh, enough for now. I'm going to be your psych. I'll be checking on uh, on you once a month. You know, be pulling you in, asking you, seeing how you're doing, and, and just check and make sure you're, you're okay. You know, you've got a psychiatric history, and I'm going to keep an eye on you. And I let him out and it was like it chills like it's like ooh. the feeling I got from him was like you know I'd rather slit your guts open and spill them all over the floor than say another word to you is what I was feeling from him but I you know I was I was partial to the Indians then they had a small little group of, of uh, different Indians they stuck to themselves and uh, I went to the head of the Indian gang and I asked him I said hey, listen what's with this guy man this is what happened this is what I experienced when he came to my office and he said uh, you be very careful with him. And uh, I went, well, okay. <laughs> he, he said, you take it slow. And I, and I did. And it was like six months before I could get this guy to really spend 15 or 20 minutes talking to me. And uh, he was telling me all these stories. He, he, was like a, he was like an evil Indian medicine man. You know, he's telling me about uh, how spirits chased him and, and how he was uh, attacked by them and the kind of things they would do. But he wasn't psychotic. He didn't fit the classical definition of schizophrenic. So I'm, I'm kind of going, you know, this, this does, what he's telling me doesn't match being crazy. Something else is going on here, and I wanted to hear him out. So uh, after he was telling me about being chased by spirits and the kind of things he saw and experienced, I kind of went, you know, held my breath and went, uh, okay, well, if, and he was telling me how he could cast spells on people and make them sick. So that got my attention. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to piss him off. So after about six months, I finally got the, the guts to ask him. I said, well, if you can do all that stuff, how come you can't stay sober? And I was bracing myself for an explosion. And he goes, because of the spirits of dead alcoholics. He said, <clears throat> if I take even one drink, they jump in there and they, they're craving more. They, they push me to drink more. They tell me I need more. You know, if, if you think about where thoughts come from, here's these spirits putting thoughts in these people's head, and that's what's happening with the schizophrenics. These voices appear as thoughts in their minds. Their schizophrenia is said to be a thought disorder. That's what psychiatrists call it, the thought disorder. But do you think they would study the thoughts? Do you think they would ask these patients anything about the thoughts? No, they're hallucinations. You know, but you know, when you tell, and working in the ERs, when I told alcoholics who came in this story, they went, yeah, yeah, that fits. That fits. You know, because as soon as they take a drink, they've lost it. You know, they've lost it, and they start thinking about the drinking. So psychiatry and, and the medical establishment and academics, all of them aren't even after well, – how long did I spend in school? It's like four years in undergraduate and four years in graduate school studying psychology and counseling, and not once was the question ever asked of where do thoughts come from. Not once. And that's what drives everything. That's what drives all behavior, you know, the, the thought and the intention. And they're not studying it. They're not studying it. They'll study the neurons and some, you know, and they're not going to find what causes paranoid schizophrenia until they understand where thoughts come from and, and what they do. Uh, you know, these, the, the voices that these people hear are thoughts being put into their 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 minds they're they're being injected into their minds and not only that these things have access to their entire memory so they can go in there and they can pull up every rotten thing these people ever did and bring it up dredge it up and rub it in their faces until their emotional state turns negative 
And then they drain that energy. So what they are is, is emotional parasites. And it doesn't just happen with schizophrenics. Remember, the, the schizophrenics are the, you know, the, the, the 5% of the normal curve. These things are hitting us all to different degrees. And it's most obvious where you're you know, kind of cruising along the street and all of a sudden minding your own business, you know, kind of you, you have your same old thought stream running there thinking about this and that. And then a thought comes in that's just horrifying. You know, it's like something you would never think, something you would never do, something you would never consider, and you kind of go, whoa, where did that come from? And you're just horrified that you have that thought. Where did, you know, it's like, what the, what, you know, yeah. yeah, and it also plays into the shame-guilt game, you know? You, you beat yourself up because you had a horrible thought, but if you're really aware and you're paying attention, then you automatically know that is not my thought. Well, a lot of people don't. You know, they think that their thoughts are who they are. Mm. You know, that that, that uh, verbal dialogue that's running through their head, they think that's who they are. But if that's the case, who's the one that's listening to it? Mm. Um, there seems to be a pattern with all these examples that you described we have emotion emotionally and mentally sometimes abused children and then more and more stress adds up then we have the escape with drugs or alcohol so and and then at some point you may or may not become psychotic, who knows. Would you say that it is a good idea in general to do what people call shadow work, meaning to get rid of that emotional and mental clutter that we are carrying around? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Matter of fact, you, we all see the world through our psychological wounds. You know, it, it affects everything we see. And if those things are buried alive, that's exactly what these things go after. They know what you have buried there. And they'll go in there and they'll start picking at it. And they'll start, they'll start putting all these thoughts in your head about whatever this shameful thing was that you did 10 years ago and that you still haven't dealt with. You know, so I wouldn't say they're completely useless because they will go right to those buried traumas, that, that, that garbage that you have stuck in your head that's buried alive and that you might have forgotten about. And they'll start picking at that scab and they'll keep picking at it and picking at it. Their purpose is to generate negative emotional energy for them to feed off of. And I don't know how many patients I've had tell me, well, you know, listen, they're, they're bringing up stuff that I've I'd done 20 years ago and long forgotten about. Mm -hmm. So if you know that... <clears throat> those negative thoughts are, are, you know, are coming from something that awful that you've done or shameful that you've done that you've buried and don't want to deal with. You need to kind of bring that garbage up and deal with it. You know, work it out. It can't be swallowed alive because it's going to affect you. Like you said, the, you, you're going to be seeing the entire world through those wounds. So if you were, you know, in my case, I got let down time after time. This is just a mild example by, by authority. You know, I, every time I trusted them, I was let down by them. And that was case after case after case after case. So here in my head is, you know, like you better watch out for authority because they're going to pull a sneaky one. They're going to, they're going to abuse you. They're going to, you know, you can't be trusted. You know, a really good book written by um, Miguel Ruiz, which is, this is the same shaman that I was reading that section to. He, he came out with a good book called uh, The Voice of Knowledge. And it talks about that internal dialogue. Now, Manuel Swedenborg says, none of your thoughts belong to you. Who you are is the one who's listening. You know, so the the dialogue that you're being fed that entity within you who's listening will either buy it or not buy it you know? and if if it buys it then 
it's it's the it's the power it's it's that's your spirit you know, this mental garbage you know every negative thought sherry you, you, she's my cohort she uh, she's helping me write a book right now that we're almost done with uh, she uh, with, heard voices as a young woman and they almost killed her and uh, I kind of ran into her by accident while we were working on prison reform issues and uh, you know you ought to interview her too because she'll you'll get it then from her side and what it was like to hear these voices too and i'm sure she'd be more than willing to talk to you okay yeah but it's the what we've both saw her and i from her personal experiences and from what i've seen is that every negative thought that flows into your head about yourself or somebody else is put there by these entities and they want you to react to it you know, and that will generate the negative emotional energy that they feed off of. Lushing. Lushing. You got it right on. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And that's what it is. They want that loose, and that's how they generate it. Mm -hmm. Now try to convince psychiatry of this, and they'll lock you up. They had their chance to get me. <laughs> yeah. I worked side by side with them for 35 years. <laughs> uh, they had every chance in the world to lock me up. They missed their chance. Mm. Now, if I was speaking like this while I was employed, I don't think I'd be employed very long. Yeah. Yeah. So they have no incentive to, to find a cure, and neither does psychiatry. Mm. You know, yeah. they, they're making a lot of money off of pawning these drugs. And you know, he, here in the U.S., they've made all these laws that you, have to, you can't get these drugs over the counter. You know, you have to pay a, psychi a psychiatrist to write you a prescription for these drugs. So you have to pay for an office visit. You have to pay for the prescription. And then you have to keep coming back over and over and over again. You go across the border, and I'm, we're, we're 60 miles from the border here. You go across the border in Mexico, you can walk into a drugstore, and you can get these over the counter. You know, mm -hmm. Nobody in their right mind would abuse any psychotic drugs. They're awful. You know, it, it's like drinking turpentine. I mean, it, it, you know, they're not abusive. Nobody's going to kill themselves with this stuff. But these guys are making a fortune F having passed laws and, and bribed Congress. I mean, they, you know, the medical establishment, the AMA, psychiatry, uh, the drug companies have a massive amount of money. And they have bought off Congress for years. So, and, and then they're, the, here's, here's, they're sitting back here, oh, the medical costs are out of control. Why are the medical costs out of control? Because they're charging for bull crap like that. You have to go through them to access these drugs where you can go across the border and just get them over the counter. And every time you need a refill, you have to go back to them to get that refill. And, and, and the drugs here cost 75% more than you, they cost in Mexico, and they're made by the same companies. Mm. No, it's maddening. It's maddening what they're doing. It's just absolutely maddening. It's, it's the biggest scam that, you know, and they're perpetuating this. You, you, you go on right now and you look up some of these, the, you know, what causes schizophrenia? Well, oh, well, it's a chemical imbalance of the brain. It's thought that, you know, uh, it's believed that, or there's a correlation with, or, you know, we think it's this gene. It's all the stuff that the normal guy can't even take a look at and examine for himself. Mm. And it's the same thing with the psychiatric population. If for, for instance, if you wanted to get into a mental hospital and start asking schizophrenics about their voices, you couldn't get in there. Mm. They wouldn't let you in. You know? I, I've visited in the past the United States many times. And what I found astonishing was that when you switched on the TV, that there was a lot of advertisement for... Yeah, let's say drugs that deal with your emotional stability, depression, what have you. I'm not saying the psychiatry here in Europe is better, definitely not. But I've never seen such amount of advertisement oh, yeah. for that. It's sickening. They control the legislators. You know, they control the Congress. Um, and you, you look at those advertisements and they'll go, you know, they show you this picture of this, these people with a big smile on their face while they're saying, oh, well, it could kill you. It could cause renal failure. It could cause heart attacks. It could cause, uh, you know, psychiatric disturbances or, or uh, 
you know, here's all this with this low, monotone, boring voice tone in the background. You know, yeah, but uh, ask your physician about this. You know, so they, they're drug pushers. And then six months later, here comes the lawyers, you know. Well, any of you who've been damaged by this drug, hey, there's a, 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 a class action lawsuit. Let us know we're, we're, we're suing these people. By then, the drug companies have made a fortune on the stuff. You know, what they're doing is they're frigging drugging the entire population. Mm. And people can't deal, you know, they're being taught by these drug companies that they can't deal with their emotions themselves, that they have to take some of this, these chemical bull crap they're selling in, in order to, to be normal. Uh, and, you, and you look at these pharmaceutical companies, they're making a fortune on this stuff. I mean, they're very powerful. They have an awful lot of money. They buy congressmen all the time. They've got, they, they've got all these laws that they pass to protect them. You can't sue them for this. You can't sue them for that. You know, uh, it, it's not, and, and they're, they're, just, they're just milking the population dry. The cost of these drugs, like I t was telling you with the antipsychotics, they didn't spend billions of dollars doing research. They ran into that by accident. And a lot of times what they do is they just change a few of the molecules and then they sell it as a new drug. It's sickening what they're doing. Mm. I would say don't fear your emotions. Nobody has to be happy all the time. That is nonsense. And you will not die if you have a couple of really bad and rough days. And yeah. these emotions are attached to something, and they are telling you something. They are telling you something. But yeah, you drug them down, what you got is a population of zombies. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, you're upset because the politicians are doing that? Well, here, take some of this stuff. That'll fix you right up. You won't be upset anymore. You know, we'll sell you all you want. You know, yeah, I don't know. It's nuts. It's nuts. Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. You know? And and. They're not going to find, they've been searching forever for a physical cause for schizophrenia, especially paranoid schizophrenia, and they're not going to find it. It's not caused by a physical malfunction. It's a spiritual disorder. You know, the spirit gets sick first and the body follows suit, and, and shamans have known this forever. You know? So it's, it's very frustrating to know what I know and to see what they're doing. It, it's, it's evil. It's it's just what they're doing is just downright evil. It, it, it's around us all the time. This is happening all the time to all of us to different degrees. It's the schizophrenics have lost control of it. The the voices have and and like Carlos Castaneda said, they give us their minds. So you see this battle when you're working with schizophrenics. You see this battle going on between. Who's controlling their mind? You know, they're fighting to keep control, and the voices are fighting to gain control, and there's this huge battle going on constantly. And when they take these antipsychotic drugs, it weakens the voices and allows the original personality to regain more control, but at the same time, they're being poisoned by that, slowly poisoned by that drug. And like I said, the truth of the matter is it is not caused by a physical malady and it's not caused by any chemical imbalance. And that's been proven over and over and over again. But still they're pushing that narrative. They, mm. you know, they don't want any, any interference with their bottom line. Yeah, it makes money. It makes a lot of money. It's one of their biggest money makers. And there's, uh, uh, what is it? 34 million people, I think it is worldwide, are afflicted with this, uh, with, with schizophrenia. You know, it, it's an epidemic. It's, it's one of the top 10 world health problems. And they're spending significantly less money on researching the cause. They're not even trying to find a cause. You know, the, the, the amount of money they're spending on research for schizophrenia is a pittance. They have no incentive to find a cure. They're making too much money just with the treatment. But at the same time, they're poisoning the people that are taking these drugs. You know, they're going to come take me away. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I've given them enough information. You know? Anybody who believes in evil spirits, there must be insane. 
they've had their chance. They've had 35 years to lock me up, and they've failed, and now they're going to pay for it. <laughs> okay, Jerry. I thank you very, very much for coming. You're more than welcome. And this was Night Flight for today. And okay. I hope you have a beautiful evening, a beautiful day, wherever you are. We see you all next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, shoot me a copy of the, the video when you get it done. I will. I'm most